Good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar, Caravans of Gold, Fragments in Time, at the National Museum of African Art. I am Pierre Pennock, Education Curator at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C. This program is made possible by the National Museum of African Art and by a Title VI grant from the United States Department of Education, which is funding National Research Centers on Africa at Howard University and on the Middle East at Georgetown University, and by the support from the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown. Joining me today are Brenda Randall, President of Africa Access and Outreach Director at the Center for African Studies, Howard University. Dr. Vanessa Oyuji, Assistant Outreach Director at the Center for African Studies, Howard University. Dr. Susan Douglas, K-14 Education Outreach Coordinator at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies, Georgetown University. We are pleased to have our keynote speaker today, Dr. Khalid Asese, Assistant Teaching Professor, Center for African Studies at Georgetown University. Dr. Asese holds bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of Nakachat, Mauritania, and the University of Sheikh Anta Diop, Senegal. He also obtained a master's degree from Bowling Green State University in Ohio while on Fulbright Foreign Student Program Fellowship. He attained his doctorate in African history at Indiana University, Bloomington, where he explored African-American and African diaspora studies, as well as global studies of slavery. Full bios of all of our panelists are in the teacher resource folder, to which we have given all participants access. It's linked on the agenda, which we will place in the chat for your access during our interactive segment of this webinar. But first, we will begin with a short tour of the Caravans of Gold, Fragments and Time exhibit at the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in Washington, DC. Here's our website to so welcome to our website by pressing africa.si.edu, you will be able to pull up our website. Our newest exhibit, Caravans of Gold, Fragments and Time, can be found under current exhibits. Once you click on it, you can click on Caravans of Gold and it will take you to this page directly. The exhibit page is set up in seven different thematic sections. Caravans of Gold, Saharan Echoes, Driving Desires, Gold and Salt, the Long Reach of the Sahara, Archaeological Imagination Station, giving context to fragments, Saharan Frontiers, Shifting Away from the Sahara, and a wonderful teaching guide complements of this museum. Black Museum Teacher's Guide. So what I'm doing is I'm going to click on a few of the themes to get you orientated in this page. The first one I've clicked on is Saharan Echoes. As you can see, if you scroll down, you'll see fragments of material, jewelry, woodworks, sources and artworks that are utilized. Under each object, if you click on each object, you'll see a full museum label and the object. I'm going to go into Driving Desires, Gold and Salt. As I click on that and scroll down, you'll see a little introduction on Mediterranean and Sahara Seas of Gold. You'll see objects such as coins, fragments, fabric, language, and as you click on each object, you'll see a complete and full museum label for your research and other resources. I'd also like to share the teacher's guide with you. 
compliments of the Block Museum. And as you scroll down, this is available in PDF. You can download it and use it for your, for your classes, and you can also share. This will be available on our website underneath the exhibit, Caravans of Gold. I just want to show you the teacher's website. If you go to the upper hand corner and you click on the arrow, it will take you through each page, the contents, the age, why teach with Caravans of Gold. It'll explain to you about the guide. Of course, it will offer further resources. And then it will start with the free activities. With our website and the teacher guide, we have what you need to research and to write and explore more on this exhibit. This companion is necessary for most teachers and even for college students. It's very thorough, 39 pages, complete, and all art selections can be accessed on our website. So I'm going back to the actual page of Caravans of Gold, and I want to go back to exhibits. And so when you pull up the exhibit, I just want to go over that this is what you'll see. And if you click on current exhibits here, it will take you to Caravans of Gold. And then when you click on Caravans of Gold, you'll see the main page of the exhibit. I would like to thank all of you for coming. And now I am pleased to announce our keynote speaker for today, Dr. Khalid Asese, Assistant Teaching Professor, the Center for African Studies at Georgetown University. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, if, you, if you permit me to call you by your first name, Pierre. Yes, of course. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, You're Pierre, welcome. Brenda, Susan, Vanessa, thank you all for involving me in this. I am really excited and uh, uh, honored to, to be joining you in this very important endeavor. Uh, I would like also to thank all the sponsors, uh, the Smithsonian of National um, Museums of African Arts, uh, the Center of uh, African Studies at Howard, the Center for Contemporary Studies at uh, Georgetown University. And I also would like to thank all the participants for the taking the time and uh, really uh, being here. Uh, and uh, so, I, like I said, I'm really thr thrilled to join you and share my insights about Islam, African Islam, and also about the Trans-Saharan trade. And I really look forward to your questions and comments at the end of my talk. This is the outline that would give you a sense about, you know, the structure and the layout of my talk and give you a sense about what I want to talk about today. Uh, starting with source of information, I think uh, as an African historian, it's important to talk about sources uh, uh, and, and, and the nature of sources that as a scholar, as a scholar of Africa that, you know, that, that we do and use to write about construct about history about the continent, and in this case, the trans-Saharan trade. Uh, so what we know and how do we know, how we know it. Uh, so that first thing, the second, I'll talk a little bit about the, the early crossing of the trans-Saharan trade, and then uh, move on, talk about the expansion of the trade. And that will be really the, fo the focus of my talk about the medieval era and the nature of that era in, in how that era looked in, 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 in West Africa. Then I'll talk, in related to that, I'll talk about imperial era in West Africa, and I'm talking about the, the three empires of gold, what scholars call the three empires of gold. That's the empire of Ghana, that's ancient Ghana, then the empire of Mali, and the empire of Songhai. And then I'll talk a little bit about the caravan cities and the nature of those cities that emerged and thrived because of the trade. And then, uh, lastly, I'll talk about the Africanization of Islam or the indigenization, indigenization of Islam. Uh, 
uh, and you know how African adopted Islam and appropriated it and made it their own. Their own, and uh, uh, and then uh, um, questions and comment at the end. Okay, where you know we have. Okay, let's see. All right, good. Okay, what we know, we know Africa this time, medieval West Africa was an important trading powerhouse. It's played a central role in the global economy. So this is really important for us as educators and as teachers to, uh, you know, help our students to see the global context of African history. And, uh, you know, to see the importance of a, using a global approach to understand African societies and African history. And why that is important, because there is always a tendency that Africa is isolated, especially we're talking about the Sahara as a place that is isolated, that is remote, that is a barrier. Uh, that's fiction, that's far away from the truth. And scholars over the last decades have really done fantastic work that shows that Africa has, uh, the Sahara has been very vibrant and dynamic. It's been a place of uh, global trade, a place of, uh, you know, uh, cross-cultural exchange and place of, uh, you know, uh, where trade brought diverse people, diverse ideas, diverse cultures, diverse civilization together. Um, and, and this is really important because, uh, you know, um, we have the tendency to talk, like I said, about the globalization in the context of North America, and especially starting with Christopher Columbus uh, um, in, uh, in 1492, where his travel brought the, you know, different people together. But globalization, you know, African have been globalizing for a thousand years before even Christopher Columbus came to the New World. And it's been and, and it's been like that, and it's still like that, you know. Uh, so that's very important. Uh, this trade also led to the um, the explosion of Islamic learning and development of cities, and these cities became a, uh, institutions of learning and institutions of Islamic productions. And I will talk a little, more, uh, a little bit about those uh, uh, th those cities later. Now, talking about the evidence uh, for constructing history, the, the history of trans-Saharan trade, uh, you know, there is always a tendency to look at African, to talk about African orality, and to talk about African as, as only African history is only based on oral sources. Um, oral sources is a very important methodology, but it's not exhaustive when we're talking about African history and writing about constructing uh, really, if we want to really construct um, an accurate, honest representation of uh, Muslim societies, and uh, in this case, uh, uh, you know, the Sahara and Trans-Saharan trade, uh, we have to take into account archaeology. We have to take into account written accounts that were written by medieval Arab and Berber, uh, you know, the, the, or the Amazigh. Amazigh is actually the right term for referring to Berber because Berber is a problematic construct, and I could talk more about that later in the Q and A. Uh, the the uh, chronicles written by Sub-Saharan African scholars, the, the Ajemi literature, which is now scholars are going back and talking about the importance of records of African languages written with using Arabic scripts. Uh, is there is vast literature that exists that scholars are just beginning to use and look at this Ajami literature. Colonial documents, reports, uh, collections that are found in, in, in family libraries, you know, manuscripts, all of that is important. And again, and in, in, in oral traditions are part of this. So this is what I use to construct this history about the long diri of trans-Saharan trade. Uh, and, and, and show that actually Africa has been a global, um, um, the, the Sahara and West Africa has been really this global hub of trade and uh, uh, um, a, a place for, you know, encounters of different civilizations and cultures. Okay, so the early crossings that I mentioned that I wanna talk about is 
uh, what you know Herodotus in his book, the Greek intellectual, uh, famous Greek intellectual historian writer, provide us some of the details, earliest details about you know the the trading activities that were happening, dating back to the period from 500 BC uh, uh, and uh, 700 AD. And this is really what he talks about. He talks about the very great nation. He refers to the Garamantes. The Garamantes are the people that now you've, you know, you found that, that were in the area of what is now the country of Libya and Algeria in North Africa. And these are the peoples, uh, even in Mauritania, present day Mauritania, there are peoples, um, uh, for instance, the Haratin communities who often are portrayed as, uh, you know, as, as, as a community of slaves and former slaves, some of them trace their genealogy, some historians trace their genealogy to the Garamantes. Uh, these you know, groups that were uh, very powerful at some points of time and they were defeated and some of them were taken as captives. What is really relevant for us for the Garamantes is are the earliest people who practiced long distance trade. They were really specializing in long distance trade and they relied on the horse drawn chariots. Um, and they created what is even those right, tr trade routes that existed around the time they were called the chariot routes. And as you see here in this, in this painting, uh, it shows you the, 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 how the Garamantes, actually the one who introduced the chariot route to, uh, uh, to, to the region, North Africa. And they were trading with uh, uh, towns in, uh, Bilad Sudan. The Bilad Sudan is the phrase that Arab, medieval Arab uh, writers and geographers and uh, scholars used to refer to the land of south of the Sahara, what is now West Africa. Uh, they used to refer to it Bilad Sudan. It's the phrase in Arabic, it means the land of the black. That's what it means. So they, these garamenters in uh, what is now Algeria and uh, Libya, they were trading with um, the people south of the Sahara and trading, and this led to the emergence of different towns like Jene Jene, the old Jene, and um, Gao. And, but this is really important because it shows you that the trade existed before the arrival of Islam. Because there is a tendency to focus, especially when we're talking about the medieval period, which is really the period that slave, uh, sorry, uh, the trade thrived is had become really uh, important, but trading existed before the arrival of Muslims and the Arabs. Uh, it existed with the Amazigh uh, uh, and the uh, Sub-Saharan Africans. They were uh, doing trade that goes back to the time of the Carthaginian. Uh, and this map here shows you the Garamantes. Uh, the you know the circle here where you see the Garamanta and you see ancient Ghana. Uh, where these, all these areas, that areas that uh, were occupied by, inhabited by the, the Garamanters. Uh, other groups that were specialized also in long distance training, the Wangara, this is the Mandinke, sometimes referred to them, there are different names, labels, uh, as known as Mandinke, Mandingo, Malinke, all of these referring to these uh, the Wangara and the Wangaras would play a very important role, especially in ancient Ghana. Uh, and then you have the Masuva and the Lamtuna. They were also the Masuva and Lamtuna. These are uh, Amazigh confederations, and that they were also uh, specialized in long distance trade. You have also Jewish traders in North Africa. Uh, that also that they were also active in in, in the Trans-Saharan trade. Also, trade was not only, uh, uh, you know, uh, with only women, it was not only men uh, specialty. Women also engaged in long distance trade. Saharan women engaged in long uh, distance trade. They were merchant, female merchants, female traders, female scholars. That's important to, 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 to highlight. And this is something that Ibn Battuta, when he came, to Mali and came to Walata, I'll talk a little bit later about those, is he referred to the, he talked about the freed, the, 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 the kind of uh, 
liberty and freedom that existed around the household and talks about the women as being, uh, uh, you know, as, as, as he talks about their, their, their power and their agency that existed in a Masjid society in pre-Islamic period. You also have other groups that later came in and became specialized in the law, in, in the trade. Uh, and this is mostly in the 19th century, 18th century, 19th century, uh, is the Tikna. Also, Aulad Bisba. These are important confederations that practice the trade. And uh, still today, some of the Tikna and Aulad Bisba, when you travel in the region, you find them are still practice trade. They practice, they are specialized in, in commerce. Uh, and they, they are known for that. Uh, like I mentioned, archaeological evidence shows us that this exchange has been happening before the Islamic era. And there was this trade route that linked North African regions with markets such as Jenna Jenna and Tadmak. Tadmak is also known as a souq. Souq in Arabic is an Arabic phrase referring to markets. Uh, so that shows you also that the place was very uh, important place for commerce and trade. Uh, different trade uh, items were, were brought there, uh, uh, including silk, including spices, uh, you know, including salt uh, and gold definitely was taken from, uh, you know, Sub-Saharan Africa going to North Africa and other parts of the Mediterranean. Uh, these are the, 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 the trade routes. The map here shows you the different routes. Uh, three main routes were very known uh, that the Eastern route that connected present day Libya and Tunisia to Central Sudan market. And you have the Western route that from Northwestern Algeria through present day Mauritania ending in the Niger River Bend. And then you have the third route that linked Eastern Sudan to Egypt. So these are the different routes that, uh, you know, camel later, I'll talk a little bit about camel and the role of the camel, what is known, become known as Qawafil Sahra in Arabic, meaning the, uh, the, the, the camel caravans were going through these different routes. And here this map shows you the different routes also, but it gives you the different trading items. I talked already about salt, gold, but also slaves uh, were, were, were being taken uh, from, from Sub-Saharan Africa, going to North Africa, but there was also slaves that were being taken from North Africa, going to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So that's important to, to keep in mind that slaves were coming, you know, going in both ways. Uh, gold, uh, salt, other items also were traded and uh, going from different parts of the you know, uh, from the south going to the north and items coming from the north going to the south. Uh, important, two important developments that led to the expansion of the trade. Uh, really, you know, that made it this global hub that we are really talking about is number one, the spread of Islam. Um, so after the Islamizations of North Africa, uh, the, re the, 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 the religion, Islam, started to spread to West and Africa. Uh, and, and Islam spread first to the West Niger Band in Senegambia, uh, in, in Mali, in Chad. Uh, the first Sub-Saharan African rulers, uh, according to historical document that accepted Islam, was the king of Tekrur. So Tekrur became this place of the cradle of Islamic civilization in West Africa. And you know, the, the name of the ruler is uh, Warajib ibn Rabis. He was the first to convert to Islam. And this is really important. It's interesting that scholars uh, uh, like uh, uh, the late Suleiman Nyang talk about this is, is, is that, you know, uh, and, 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 and the scholars like Usman Khan uh, at Harvard University talk about that the name that African this is really important dimension about the conversion of Islam that happened in Africa, that the rulers were the first to accept Islam. The kings were the first to accept Islam. And they were not accepting Islam because Islam, just Islam made sense to them. They accepting Islam because Islam gave them access to other civilizations. Islam gave them access to different 
trade routes. Islam, they were, they were practical. They were practical reasons. Of course, they were theological reasons, but they were also very practical and pragmatic about uh, accepting Islam. So uh, by 17th century, Islam had direct contact almost in uh, every part of West Africa. So Islam brought a new language, new system of writings, uh, which is Arabic. And I'll talk about it about especially when, it, when we talk about the Ajami literature. It also brought new ideas, new legal law system, uh, brought papers. Uh, it also, uh, you know, led to the growth of camels because the Arabs were, uh, you know, specialized in camels. Uh, especially uh, uh, the dromedarian camels, the Arabian camel. And this is even mentioned in the Quran. In, in the Quran talks about this, you know, uh, in, 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 in Surah, Surah Quraysh. There is one chapter in the Quran that is called the chapter of Quraysh. Quraysh is the Arabian, uh, is the, the tribe that the prophet is from the tribe of Quraysh. That was dominant in pre-Islamic Arabia is that Quraysh was the, 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 the dominant tribe in Mecca. And the Quran talks about this, this in this chapter talks about this uh, journey that happens in, in the winter and summer. Called the, 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 the Quran mentioned it in, in, in this surah that is called Quraysh. The ilavi Quraysh ilavim rihlat al-shita'i wa saif The journey of winter and summer. So, so they were very, and these journeys happened, they were using camels. So when they came to uh, uh, North Africa, they brought that skills with them. Uh, and that helped with the expansion of the trade. Uh, they brought the, like I mentioned, the dromedary camel or the one single hump, uh, humpback camel. Uh, and the camel, why the camel becomes very important because the camel of its ability, its, its endurance, and its ability to go days without food and water and becomes known as the, the sheep of the desert. Uh, because it's really the camel that revolutionized the trans-Saharan trade uh, with Islam. Because the camel uh, allowed communities, now the Sahara people were cross, crisscrossing, but very few communities settled in the Sahara. With the camel, people are able to reside in the Sahara Desert. People are able to, you know, that led to the emergence of new settlements and communities and towns that later would become towns of uh, Islamic learning, towns like, like Walata, Sijilmasa, uh, Tishit, Wadan, and others that would emerge and become these, you know, these, uh, these important uh, centers. Uh, the development, uh, also with the camel, people are now able to carry more merchandise, more goods. Uh, the volume increases, the volume of salt, gold, slaves, all items, uh, nuts, Arabic gum, all of that increases because of the camel. And there were two types of camels that I want to talk about. Um, there were two types of caravans. Camel caravaning that, that's happening. One, and this is Ibn Hawqal, talks about this in two types of the, the camel caravans. One is called the large camel caravan uh, that is uh, organized annually and involves thousands of camels. And hundreds of men, and it was multi-directional. And the second one is a small camel caravan. And this is typically less than 100 animals uh, and a smaller group of men. Uh, this, is, this is the time, like I mentioned, is of the great Saharan connectivity. And anthropologist Judith Sheila talks about this in her book, Smugglers and Saints of the Sahara, where she argues that Sahara is best understood by its extensive uh, network of connectivity and long-standing mobility. And she talks about the, the, the Saharan economy of oasis agriculture that acted as a trading hub that connected wide network of, of people. So that one perspective by uh, 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 Judith Sheila. 
The other perspective by Gillan Lydon, historian Gillan Lydon at UCLA, that she talks about the legal institutions and how legal institutions developed and allowed, you know, uh, you know, merchants who were most of the time scholars uh, that were regulating dispute and uh, and offering services. Uh, so this is led to the network of legal authorities uh, across the different settlements of the Sahara. Now I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the three empires of gold uh, that I mentioned earlier. In, in the map you see them, you see the empire of Ghana and Songhai and, 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 and Mali. This is the three empires that, 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 that thrive it because of the trans-Saharan trade. Um, you know, they thrive it because they were able to, you know, control the trade routes and they were able to offer protections. Remember, Sahara is a, the Sahara Desert is the biggest desert in the world. It's very vast desert. There are always people uh, who are known as the, in the Arabic word for them is the cutters of the roads, people who, you know, practice ro high robbery and people who are, you know, trying to, you know, uh, kidnap people. And that's why you have a lot of slaves because people were kidnapping people and people were taking people as captives. And all of that was happening, the insecurity. And these empires were able to provide uh, uh, security. And they also tax the caravans. So that's also, that's where the riches, they started to have, uh, the wealth comes in. Uh, you have the ancient Ghana. Ancient Ghana, um, you have the, you know, archaeologists um, were able to talk about, you know, to the evidence that we have from archaeology and uh, Arabic accounts talks about two towns. Um, uh, the towns that were, you know, uh, you know, Muslims towns that were with, you know, that, that, that existed within ancient Ghana. And these usually Muslim towns that are, you know, that usually foreign traders, but you also have some locals who started to convert to Islam. Remember the, the, king, the kingdom of Takrur uh, coexisted with the ancient of Ghana. So the, 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 the ruler of Takrur, when he converted, people start to convert. To, to Islam, and that led to some uh, um, the increase of converts. Uh, also, the ancient Ghana is known as you know in as Wagadugu, Wagadu. Sorry, uh, that's also the Suninka name for 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 ancient Ghana. Uh, how did ancient Ghana? There are theories about how the the, the Ghana was. Uh, defeated. Uh, there is Arabic account that the Muravid movement that came from North Africa, you know, Muravid, Al Murabitun, the Arabic name for them, uh, that were able to defeat ancient Ghana. Uh, there are scholars who dispute that uh, and argue that ancient Ghana, uh, you know, uh, uh, declined because of internal decay and internal conflict. Uh, and problems. Uh, according to Wagadu oral account, it, it's, 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 it's attributed to the rain. The rain stopped falling and religious tradition neglected the gods and ancestors took revenge and that led to the collapse of ancient Ghana. I'll, I can talk more about that later. You also have the, the, the empire that, that came after Ghana is the empire of Mali. And this is really, Empire of Mali is really the, the time when West African uh, reaches, rich, you know, Africa reach its uh, really the highest um, opulence. And it becomes really the time that the trade thrived in West Africa. And it was founded by Sunjata, known as the Lion King. Um, and you know, Ibn Battuta described Mali as the most powerful in kingdom in Bilad Sudan, the land of the blacks. Um, Ibn Khaldun, sorry. And um, 
Ibn Battuta also visited it in Mali in the 14th century, and he talks about the, 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 the Islamic learning. He talks about kids memorizing the Quran, uh, t talking, talks about the practices of school, Islamic school, uh, schooling in, in Mali and the nature of that schooling. Um, we also know that the empire of Mali is very famous because of Mansa Musa and his travel to, uh, he, when he went on pilgrimage, he went to Mecca in 1324, where he distributed so much gold and he took with him hundreds and hundreds of slaves on large caravans. Um, uh, th this is the map that gives you a sense of the routes that he took, uh, the different routes that Mansa Musa in his route to, to Mecca. Now the successor of Mali is the, the, the Songhai, uh, the dynasty of the Songhai peoples. And again, like Mali, like ancient Ghana, they were able to, uh, to thrive and become very prosperous because of the Trans-Saharan gold trade. Um, and the famous, uh, one of the famous Songhai, um, uh, you know, Songhai became very famous because also of the, the scholars, um, you know, the, the Askiya Muhammad, the famous uh, ruler of Songhai invested so much in Islamic learning. And this is really the time when uh, places like Timbuktu uh, become really a hub for Islamic institution and Islamic learning. And really when, you know, and, and that's really, really important at the time where you have Timbuktu a place, not only for uh, Sub-Saharan African scholars, but it's a place of multicultural. It became a, a cosmopolitan, uh, a place of multi-ethnic, multiracial, it's a place for different groups, Amazigh, Sub-Saharans, Arabs coming together and creating this, this interesting uh, uh, place. Uh, this is the, 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 gives you a sense of the cities that, uh, that emerged. Uh, and this is the, 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 the cities that thrive it because of the the, the Trans-Saharan trade. And you can see some of the famous cities in the north, you have Sijil Masa. Sijil Masa become really, really um, an important place. And especially during the time of al murabiqun and later al muwahidun uh, who controlled it. Once they controlled it, they were able to move to, to control the Trans-Saharan trade and also move to Spain. Uh, you have places like Odakost, uh, you have Wadan, and you have also the 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 on the map here. You, saw, you see the 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 the, the Jil. The Jil is the mine where salt were coming from the the Sahara. Salt was really an important commodity that came from the Sahara and was transported to uh, to uh, to uh, Sub-Saharan Africa because salt, as we know. At the time, there was no such refrigeration. So the, the refrigeration, uh, salt was the refrigeration in medieval time. And a lot of uh, sub-Saharan uh, needed salt and the salt was coming uh, from the Sahara. At the same time, gold was coming to, from sub-Saharan Africa, going to, uh, to North Africa and other places. Uh, an important city that I wanna talk about uh, is Shingiti. And Shingiti is in the present day Mauritania. It was known as the intellectual capital of the region. Uh, before Shingiti, there were cities like Chiti, uh, Tishit, Wadan, but Shingiti has really become this, this intellectual hub. Uh, you know, uh, Usman Khan uh, uh, you know, wrote this book called Beyond Timbuktu. And what he argues in that book is looking he is trying to encourage us to not look only at Timbuktu and look at cities that emerged and thrived that are beyond just Timbuktu. We all know about the history of Timbuktu, but we need to look really um, beyond Timbuktu and look at places like Shingiti uh, and the global uh, role that it played, the role that played in global trade, but also in the, 
in, in the global Islam. Uh, we look at Walata, we look at Tadmak, we look at other places that are. So Shingiti uh, be, is become even today, Mauritania is known as the land of Shanqit, which is Bilad Shanqit, referring to the, the town, because the town defined the, the, the whole region uh, at some point. And especially during the 19th century where the town became uh, known, became known as uh, a, a place where caravans that were going on the Hajj, going to pilgrimage to Mecca, departed from that place. And people who went to Mecca, places on went to the Middle East, went to, uh, not to Al Hijaz, went to Cairo, went to other places. They were, became known as Shanaqita, referring to the place uh, uh, Shanqit. So that even today it stuck with Mauritania. That's really referring to it as the Shanaqita coming from uh, from this era. The other place, of course, that we know about is Timbuktu. You know, um, Timbuktu was founded as a Tuareg camp, and during the Mansa Musa time, it thrived because Mansa Musa supported Muslim scholars. He supported schools. He supported mosques. Uh, he invested a lot, a lot in Islamic learning and Islamic. Uh, 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 Islamic uh, manuscript, and this is the time when uh, the city become known for its rich libraries and uh, manuscripts. Like I mentioned, education in Timbuktu uh, is also very distinctive because it became a, this multiracial, multi-ethnic. Uh, scholars who are Amazigh, who are Africans, were all coming to Timbuktu. Uh, also, education also is very distinct because of the way it was not only about schools. We often talk about the Sankore Mosque in Timbuktu, but education become really tied to communities. These extended families and extended lineages um, that became specialized uh, in, 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 in Islamic learning and Islamic education. So, and, and this, this group, when they move around the town and move around the regions, they move, uh, they, they, they are, th these groups who are become really uh, known for, uh, who become in charge of education in places like Tumbuktu and other places. Uh, this is from uh, a drawing of Tumbuktu from Rena Kaye. Uh, Rena Kaye was the first French to reach Tumbuktu and come back alive. There were Europeans, Westerners who came to Tumbuktu but they did not come back. He was the first to come and, you know, reach Timbuktu and come back with description of the city and the town. Of course, some of there is, there are problems with some of those descriptions, but also this description that he, you know, his writing provide interesting uh, insights about the, the city. And this is, it shows you the town, the layout of the town. It shows you the houses, it shows you the mosques. It shows you, uh, gives you a sense of how Timbuktu looked uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the 19th century. The, now I want to move and talk about Islamic Arctic, uh, is, uh, about the Africanization of Islam. And I really want to focus here on two uh, aspects. One is Islamic architecture that is very distinct to Africa, but also focus on the uh, literacy. And you could see here, uh, this is the mosque. This is the Sankore Mosque. Uh, Timbuktu is very, and sometimes it's referred to as the university, Sankore University, as the oldest uh, university in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. Kwame Krumah, uh, in his uh, inaugural speech, uh, in uh, the independence of Ghana, he talks about the Sankore, he talks about Timbuktu, he talks about, uh, uh, the town of Walata, sorry. So th this is the, the mosque and it, it, if really look, it's very different because this is an, a mosque that is made with mud and you see the woods in the, in the mosque. This is the second picture here is uh, inside the mosques. So it give you a sense. And then you have the third picture that gives you also a sense of how the mosque looked, and it's very different from, uh, uh, let's say, uh, 
a Middle Eastern mosque. Um, this is also, this is from the town of Walata. I just mentioned Walata. Um, it's often uh, portrayed as a sister city of Timbuktu. Uh, Walata also was uh, a place of uh, a cosmopolitan place. And uh, no, sorry, this is, sorry. Uh, this is, this is Shinqit. I was, you know, this is the mosque in Shinqit, which is made with, um, as you see, with stone. So it's very different from the one in Timbuktu. Uh, this is uh, made with stones and you see the houses uh, are very different. Uh, uh, it's a different kind of architecture. Uh, this is the mosque in Larabanga in Ghana, uh, in Northern Ghana. Uh, so it also gives you a different flavor about the architecture, the different architectures that exist in, 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 in uh, Muslim societies, in African Muslim societies. This is what I was talking about. This is the houses in Walata. And this is the traditional wall art on houses in Walata. When you go to, this is only unique in Walata. It does not exist in other places. And you see the houses, the doors, um, you know, and see the wall are decorated. And this is um, attributed, this is, you know, according to a historian, this is something that was imported from the Andalus, from Andalusia, from Spain. Uh, after the, the, the uh, uh, Muravid uh, conquest, people who came from, uh, you know, from Spain and moved it to Walata, they brought this architecture with them. And it's very distinct and it's still practiced today. Of course, it has evolved and people have modified it. And it's only the specialty of women. And the women from the category of known in, 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 in the Sahara as the Ma'almin. This is a, a blacksmith caste who are specialized in, in doing this, this kind of arts. And they do it on houses, they do it on mosques. Um, uh, and nowadays it become, uh, you know, um, a profession for them uh, where they do it for in even if you go to contemporary uh, uh, you go to you know places you know big cities in in the Sahara in Mauritania uh, you see them and but in other places if you go to other places even in, in 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 Senegal you see people go to you know use the same decorations now I want to talk about literacy uh, and and uh, talk quickly about you know the 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 importance of education, the Saharan traditions of schooling, the the the, the tradition of schooling. Uh, sorry, tradition of schooling uh, that existed. Uh, this is this is a school. This is this is very unique to African societies. And this uh, really, uh, the tradition that is based on a law, it's a wooden writing board. And it has existed for a very, very long time. And uh, it's still practiced today. It's existed for thousands of years. And it's not only unique to the Saharan communities, it's also in, 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 in other places. Like in Senegal, you have, still have today, um, uh, you know, the, the, in Mauritania, this, this, this setting is called the Mahlara, but in Senegal, you have it, the, the wall of, you know, use the term Dara for it, uh, which is, comes from Arabic word Darul Quran, the house of Quran. But you have also, you have it in other places. Uh, and I can talk more about it uh, later. Uh, what is distinct about the Saharan uh, uh, system of education is, is, they call it higher education under the tent. And it's, what's really important that need, we need to keep in mind here, two things or three things. One is the role of the verse. Uh, the Saharan Mauritanian is known as the, uh, the land of one million poets, as I mentioned already. So verse was very important for memorizing uh, texts, uh, memorizing uh, scholarly texts. Also it's important, like I mentioned already, the role of women. Women were scholars, they were female sc scholars. Uh, who contributed to production of knowledge. Um, you have also the tradition of taqrib. 
uh, the expatriation. And this tradition of taqrib was really uh, uh, important. When the student reach a certain level, uh, they go abroad. So they travel to a different town, they go to Tumbuktu, or they go to Walata, or they go to Shanqit, or they go to another important place where they could learn uh, uh, more about Islam. You also have the Ajami literature. And this is my last point. Um, I think I'm running out of time. Uh, the Ajami literature is also uh, is very important tradition that has existed and that has allowed uh, people to allow uh, Sub-Saharan Africans also to produce knowledge. Uh, and it's, 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 uh, it's an important literature uh, that was produced in, in different African languages. So you have Ajami in Hausa, you have it in Wolof, you have it in, uh, in Songhai, you have it in different languages that was produced for thousands of years. And it's very important to uh, to uh, uh, to keep that in mind when we're talking about the Africanization of Islam and the practices that existed over thousands of years in in, in West Africa. Uh, I think uh, the the other point that I also I want to talk about is the libraries, the nature of rich libraries that existed. Uh, these are known. We know about. We've heard about the libraries that existed in Timbuktu. Uh, but again, like I said, there are other centers. Uh, uh, it is reported that there are th over six, about 6,000 rare books and manuscripts, uh, including the oldest Quranic text in existence in, in the town of Shanqil. Uh, and uh, so that's, uh, that's, and this is, this is just here, it shows you, this is a handwritten Quranic text written by the locals. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and it gives you a sense of the kind of tradition, scholarly tradition that existed in the region. Uh, this is the end. I think I exhausted my time. Thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to your comments and questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Asese. We have one question for you. Uh -huh. um, it, the person asked if you could talk about the role of donkeys in the trade. Were they crucial to the trade prior to the widespread use of the camel? The, the donkeys, yes. Um, so the, the, the donkeys were, were, were absolutely used and also horses. Uh, and uh, used during the time that I mentioned, especially the time of the, the garamentes. Uh, uh, they were used, but you know they they had some limitations on them because the Sahara is a very difficult uh, place to cross, and the donkey is really uh, and horses were not really made for that kind of long distance traveling and also carrying a lot of uh, goods and a lot of merchandise. So they were widely used, but people use them, but once the camel, and, and at the same time, and then I need to mention this, probably I did not clarify it in my, in my presentation, is the camel was used, the Romans used the camel, but they did not, they were not uh, nomadic people like the Arabs, they did not know it. It's only when they, with the arrival of the Arabs, who were specialized, like I mentioned, there were people who were doing this long distance traveling in Arabia, who really use it skillfully and strategically, and the camel become really, uh, uh, like I mentioned, the sheep of the desert. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, they were used, but it's uh, there were some limitations. Thank you. Our next question is: um, What primary sources, material and or textual, for these histories do you find to be accessible to undergraduate students? Um, this particular person has used excerpts from Ibn Khaldun, Ibn Batula, Batuta, and Sundiata, but would love to broaden uh, the use of primary sources. So that's a good question. I think, uh, I think this is where it comes, the Ajami literature. Uh, the challenge with Ajami literature, of course, is the translation. Because, you know, uh, there haven't been a lot of 
translation that has been done about Ajami literature. Um, but scholars are now doing that kind of work. You know, Falun Gam and, you know, at Boston University, the Senegalese uh, anthropologist who has done really fantastic work on Ajami literature. Uh, but there are others. So Ajami literature uh, is one of them. Uh, there are, you know, Arabic manuscripts that has been translated and collection of books, interesting primary sources in Arabic beyond Ibn Khaldun and Ibn Tuta and Ibn al hawqal and those famous ones, there are others. Um, and there are also uh, manuscripts, uh, primary sources that were produced by, like, a, a, like I mentioned, African scholars in Nigeria, in uh, beyond, you know, Timbuktu, beyond Mali, in Nigeria, in Niger, in Senegal. Uh, there's also the murid, you know, when you, you know, it depends really on what you are really looking at and the topic that you're really looking at. There is a vast of, you know, primary sources that you could use. Uh, for example, if you were thinking about Sufism, teaching about Sufism and um, the practices, uh, Sufi practices in West Africa, I would recommend, you know, murid literature that has been translated, that gives you really interesting perspective of, about the distinct nature of, you know, Sufi practices in West Africa. So there is a lot, and it depends on what really, what you're really looking at and what you want to focus on. Thank you. I, uh, this next question, I believe you pretty much answered. It was, do you have suggested resources for pre-Islamic education, educational site? Um, and I'm not sure with what you talked about if that is inclusive in that. Yeah, so, so I would say, you know, pre-Islamic uh, period, mostly, you know, uh, I would say oral, tra oral, oral traditions, uh, looking at songs. So for example, like the, you know, Sunjata, the story of Sunjata, we know about it because of, you know, the, the griot in Mali. They have, it's been the story that has been uh, passed from generation to one generation to another generation. So I would say oral sources, songs, proverbs, um, but also archaeological evidence. So archaeological evidence, um, bot botany uh, also provides, you know, interesting and also linguistic evidence, linguistic sources uh, that also provides, you know, um, uh, you know, important insight about the pre-Islamic era, uh, 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 you know, of, of, of West Africa. And I could, I could put a list of sources and, and share it with, with, with you, you know. Uh. Thank you. And this is the last question. Um, uh, the question is, is it possible for the mosque in present day Ghana to date to the eighth century? Uh, the mosque in present day Ghana, there is a, that's a very interesting question because the mosque in present day Ghana, there are a lot of uh, theories that are being thrown around about when it was established, when it was, uh, uh, you know, founded, who founded it. Uh, there are stories about uh, a saint who traveled or an Islamic scholar who traveled from Mecca, from, Hij from Arabia, and came to uh, Ghana and established the mosque. But really, you know, uh, uh, you know, the, the 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 document that I've been look that I've been able to look at is it was established probably uh, around the 13th century, uh, and there are other versions, there are other sources that they would establish it in the 17th century, uh, but not really. I haven't seen anything about 8th century, uh, really. But uh, uh, that's so that's what I know so far. Uh, but there are different theories about when it was established and who established that mosque. Okay, thank you. And we actually have uh, time for one more question, and I think this one is pretty interesting. Is the role of women as scholars unique or particular to Africa? Is, the, is this similarly due to the prevalence of matriarchal um, matrilineal social structure before the spread of Islam in Africa? Uh, that's a very interesting question. I, I would say, I would say, you know, in, and, and this is, um, this is, this is, this is really, this is a really interesting question. Um, because one, yes, part of it 
especially in the Sahara, is part of the uh, matriarchal culture that existed in uh, the Imazigh communities, where women uh, had a lot of liberty and a lot of power, especially around the household. Uh, and women really were the educators. And this is in some, in some aspects, it still exists. Uh, when children at a very young age, when they start learning the Quran, the, the people who educate them, women are the ones who educate them, who teach them how to memorize the Quran, before even they go to study ulum al-deen, to study these other Islamic sciences like, uh, you know, jurisprudence or the seerah or other anything. They study the Quran with their mothers or with their, you know, cousins or sisters, elder sisters. So women had that traditions that, you know, existed in pre-Islamic era that allowed them when Islam came to just to develop it and, and, and become really, um, but also, you know, you also have to, uh, and, but that role also diminished with the arrival of the Arabs uh, because, the, you know, in Arabia, Arabs, you know, it's a patriarchal society where, that, where women did not have a lot of freedom and a lot of uh, uh, agency. And Islam, when it came even in Arabia, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was hard to eradicate these practices. Uh, it was very difficult, you know, and the Islam tried, you know, uh, the Prophet Muhammad and, you know, uh, you know and, and, and tried really to write, kind of get rid of those practices because women uh, in Arabia were even, you know, if you have, you know, if you're an Arabian, uh, father and you have a daughter, you kill it. That was the tradition, that was the practice because of the idea of honor and shame. So that was, and the Islam when it came, it kind of eradicated that. So that was, they stopped it. Uh, but again, the, the practical, the, the, the patriarchal practices remain it, some of it remain it. And when the Arab moved to uh, uh, Africa, they brought with them some of those traditions that influenced the Berber, uh, the Imazic practice uh, societies. But in other parts of uh, West Africa, women also were allowed, were given the opportunities to receive education. We know, of course, about Nana Asma'u in, in Nigeria, in Northern Nigeria, in the time of the Sokoto Khalifa, where she became a, a very famous scholar, a poet, uh, produced a lot of literature and you know, we are, even in America today, you still in, 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 in you have the, the Yantaro. The Yantaro is going back to Nana Asma'u. It's a movement of women, really, about the education of women and promoting women scholarship, women education, and women. So this tradition, yes, it existed, but it was really heavily, uh, you know, uh, kind of, um, influenced by Arabian uh, practices, especially the, when the Arab came to uh, the Sahara, it kind of limited the, the agency that women had and the power that they had. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Dr. Asesa, for that amazing uh, lecture and presentation. We thank you so very much. Uh, caravans of gold. Now we're going to do a matching activity. Um, I was a middle school uh, library media specialist for many years and uh, during my time there I created these matching activities to introduce research topics uh, to students. Uh, the matching or sort of kind of like a game approach helped the students listen and engage with topics that were new to them. Uh, they all wanted to get a perfect score and so I tried to write the clues to make sure that they could, just a way to kind of get them to listen and see what is available and possible for them to research. So what we're going to do today is we're going to do a matching activity to introduce artifacts from caravans of gold. Uh, to do this, you're going to need to get a piece of paper and a pencil. So I give you a few seconds to grab something Grab paper and a pencil. And you are going to number your paper from 1 to 11, as you see over to the right. 
Uh, now, in the next slide, you're going to see a photos of 11 artifacts from the Caravan of Gold exhibit. And you're going to listen as I read descriptions of these objects. On your numbered paper, you will write the number of the object I am describing. And I don't know if you might need to minimize the, your video box so that you can get a full view of the screen. Okay, we're going to do this first one together. Here's the clue. You ready? This is number one. One of the oldest surviving textiles from West Africa is this woven tellum blanket. Look to find the woven tellum blanket. And it's number nine. So on your paper beside number one, you will write nine. Okay, now we'll go on to the other clues. Two, engravers in Sijimasa, Morocco, began minting gold coins like this one in the 10th century. Can you find that gold coin? There's something else that's gold there that's close, but that's not it. And I'm not telling this answer. We'll talk about it later. Number three. This 14th century circular gold pendant was found in a grave in Saint Louis, Senegal. Find the circular golden pendant, write the number beside number three. Everybody for sure will get this one. We've already seen it. Number four, Tuareg from Algeria fashioned this camel saddle. Number five, this bead was unearthed in the city of Gao in Mali. Number six, the learned scholar Ahmed Baba reported they dictated this 16th century Arabic treatise to his student. An Arabic treatise. Number seven, this cap made with cowrie shells was excavated from a grave in northern Nigeria. Number eight, potters in medieval Mali used local resources to make terracotta vases like this one. Number nine, a 14th century artist in Italy used gold leaf from West Africa to decorate this painting of the crucifixion of Jesus. Number 10. This mounted horseman was excavated in Mali, in Bocconi, Mali. Number 11, the last one. A French artist used ivory from the tusk of a savanna elephant to make this statue of the Madonna and child. And now for the answers. When I'm doing this in the class, they just, we, you know, we kind of go through them and, you know, they, they yell out their answers and we have a good time uh, talking about the different topics that we're, Providing. So what we're going to do here, uh, number one, of course, number nine, uh, is a fragment of a woven blanket from uh, the Telum people in Mali. It dates back to the 15th century here over here on the left. And they were found among burial remains in caves. And they're some of the oldest surviving textiles from West Africa. We always try to give students a present connect. So that's what we've done in this activity. If you look over here to the right, here's our present connect, which is a, a Fulani tent panel, which comes from the mid 20th century. And one of the things that you may notice is that these weaving designs are similar. Class, classic weaving and design traditions are evident in, in this 20th century full bay tent from Mali. Number two, the answer is five. 
engravers in Sil de Massa, Morocco, began minting gold coins like this one in the 10th century. Uh, and as we've heard from uh, Dr. Sessa, uh, Sil de Massa was in fact a vital link in the, the African gold trade. And their mint began striking coins as early as the 10th century. And evidence strongly suggests the West African gold passed through the area as early as the fourth century. Okay, what's our present connect? Well, the names of early Moroccan rulers were often imprinted on gold coins. Now this tradition of highlighting political leaders on coin is found, well, all over the world and can be seen on this commemorative coin of Mali's first president, Modibo Keita. Number three is number eight. This 14th century circular gold pendant was found in a grave in saint Louis, Senegal. Uh, these, the grave goods which were, uh, this pendant was found with other uh, objects and they were buried with a young man about 20 years old, who was clearly of a high status to be wearing something so large and so beautiful in gold. Uh, if you look over here also, this ring comes from Senegal. And we can see that uh, for centuries, uh, Senegal has remained in dialogue with the past and of course, more recently with the world. Their styles and designs embrace change, yet remain resolutely local and grounded in history and tradition. Number four, the saddle that we saw before, the Tuareg saddle, number four from Algeria. Uh, and you'll see over here on the right, these are, this is in rock art and you'll see camels uh, in the, the uh, Saharan rock art. Uh, the present connect. Uh, you can see saddles similar to the one that we uh, looked at today among contemporary Tuareg traveling in the Sahara. And now Vanessa. The answer to number five is number two. This bead was unearthed in the city of Gao in Mali. And as you see the picture on the left is a stone bead. Now there are many sorts of beads that have been excavated in the region and sites have relieved large quantities of colored glass beads that were made throughout the Mediterranean region, North Africa, as well as in the African forest. Our present connect on the right is uh, our contemporary uh, pieces of jewelry that are made and worn by Amazigh groups in Algeria and Morocco. The top picture is a pendant um, with coral beads that was made in Kabyle in Algeria. And the bottom picture is a Amazigh bride wearing necklaces and headdresses and bracelets using silver, coral, and amber beads. Number six, the answer is three. The learned scholar Ahmed Baba reportedly dictated this 16th century Arabic treatise to his student. This was a treatise on ethics and the title was The Uttermost, the Uttermost Hope in the Preference of Sincere Intention Over Action, a Treatise on Ethics. He was a prolific scholar. Uh, more than 60 works are ascribed to him, mainly in the field of jurisprudence. Among these works is his much discussed fatwa on slavery in which he rejects categorically the association of blackness with unbelief and the corollary argument that blacks are naturally enslavable bodies. Uh, the present connect is the Ahmed Baba Institute. If you see the picture on the right is the old building that was built uh, somewhere in the 70s and 1970s. And the, build, the picture above is the newer building, the contemporary building, which is showing uh, the library connections there on the left. And you can see staff offices at the top. And this building was built, I think it was at least opened on, in 2009. And the architect was uh, a South African architect. And this Ahmed Baba Institute houses extensive resources for studying and preserving Timbuktu's um, famous manuscripts. Uh, number seven, the answer to this is 11. This cap made with cowrie shells was excavated from a grave in northern Nigeria. And we took a picture here of the reconstruction drawing of the cowrie shell cap. Um, this, this cap was excavated from very high status tombs at Dorbi Takushei, which is in the savannas of northern Nigeria. 
And these elite burials are remarkable for the concentration of materials that characterize trans-Saharan trade, which is metal worth from the Islamic clans, glass beads from far ranging locales, cowrie shells from the Indian Ocean and lots of other ornaments. Um, our present connect here is the group of Nawa musicians that are performing at, in a large square in Marrakesh in Morocco. And the, these cowrie adorned hats are among the material objects that are used to express the Nawa identity. Uh, number eight is uh, 10. Potters in medieval Mali used local resources to make terracotta vases uh, like this one here uh, on the left, which dates back somewhere between the 10th and the 14th century. Uh, now, what sc scholars have identified are the persistent patterns that have remained over time. Here's our present connect. This is a, go a Dogon water jar. So persistent pottery designs that, that just follow over the centuries or are traced down through the centuries. Uh, number nine is number six. A 14th century artist in Italy used gold leaf from West Africa to decorate this painting of the crucifixion of Christ. And there are scholars who have argued that the rise of the e Italian um, gold coins in the 13th century can be correlated with this use of gold leaf on the panel paintings. So what they did, they took these coins and they would beat the coins uh, until they were able to produce these thin sheets of bow leaf, which they would then use to uh, decorate, illuminate paintings. And our present connect uh, from the 20th century and our Baule artist from Cote d'Ivoire, uh, the artisan of this contemporary comb used gold, uh, gold, the gold, similar kind of gold leafing techniques that is really centuries old. 10. This mounted horseman was excavated in Bancoli, Mali. One of the things that would always surprise my students was the fact that there were horses and they liked to do projects about horses uh, in, from medieval Mali. And this, the, the one that you saw, which was just one horseman, they be, believe came from a, a group uh, because these were found with the horsemen. And they are uh, portrayed wearing the accoutrements that reflect the wealth of the region, which was heavily involved in Trans-Saharan exchange. The mounted horseman points to the importance of cavalry for expanding control and maintaining security. We read about this a lot in, particularly in, the, in, in Ghana, early the first kingdom, and how they were able to defeat their neighbors and get power because they had horses. Uh, this uh, one below, this equestrian figure is at the Museum of African Art. And it's, uh, it has both the horseman and the horse uh, dressed, showing that perhaps this is a ceremonial military attire. And our present connect, uh, Durbar, the Durbar Festival is an annual festival which is celebrated in several cities in Nigeria. And there's so many pictures of these horsemen with their horses. They kind of coordinate their outfits with the horsemen that are on the internet. Your students will love to see these. And number 11 is seven. A French artist used ivory from the tusk of a savanna elephant to make this statue of the Madonna and child. A large scale virgin and child statuettes represent the apogee of ivory carving in the Gothic period. And this sculpture is among the largest, measuring 16.5 centimeters in diameter, diameter at its widest point. It could, have been, it could only have been made from the tusk of a savanna elephant. During these times, tusks from elephants were preferred, from savanna elephants were preferred because they were larger than tusks from elephants in other regions. And they were often transported in these uh, cam camel caravans that Dr. Asesa was speaking of earlier. The present connect we have here is a picture of a herd of elephants at a waterhole in Penjari um, National Park, which is in northern Berlin and Benin. And we have a quote there from uh, a ranger that says, West African elephants are fairly aggressive by nature because they've been slaughtered in this region for centuries. Another particularity of West African elephants are their very small tusks, which goes against what we just learned. 
but they have smaller tusks since poaching has changed their genetic makeup. All those with big tusks have been killed. Now that's a very chilling byproduct of, you know, not only trans-Saharan trade, but uh, poaching that has continued well into contemporary uh, times. But with these artifacts in mind, these are the 11 artifacts we just discussed, we will move on to our next activity. If this object could speak, what would it say? And our colleague Susan Douglas will guide you with instructions on what to do. Okay, good afternoon. I'm going to um, share my screen here and bring this up. Um, this has been very educational for me too, and we would like to now hand it off to um, to create some breakout groups that will allow you to um, engage with the artifacts in the, in the uh, exhibit on your own. Um, all of you have received in the chat uh, the link to the teacher resource folder and um, we will give you the, what, will you, what you can do then is to go and open it. But first I want to introduce the activity uh, generically. Uh, we have selected um, an activity where in your groups, you can make this object speak. So it's a method of visual analysis. Uh, if this object could speak, what would it say? We have a number of activity sheets, however, that go a little bit deeper than this, but for the present purposes in this webinar uh, with a lot of people, we have just chosen uh, four questions. So when you get into your groups, you can choose a speaker from your breakout group to be the object in our debrief after, we, after you complete your activity for, for 10 or 15 minutes. The questions are, what makes me, the object, especially interesting or beautiful as an object in the exhibit? What technical skills were needed to produce me, which lets you really look into the, you know, get inside the object and, and, and begin to imagine how it was made. What story do I have to tell about the life and times of the people who made and used me? And then as they made the present connect, is there anything similar to me, this object in your lives today? So we hope you'll really ham it up. Uh, and what I want to do is to give the directions. Um, the, uh, each group will correspond. So if you'll, you'll, you'll see your breakout group will have group one, group two, group three, and so on. Um, and we will be making 11 groups. So you'll have about um, seven or eight people in each group. And your object that you'll be focusing on is numbered corresponding to the match activity. So we have this, um, this whole sheet prepared for you in the resource folder. Um, I will put it into the group chat right now. So what you will have in these activities, uh, in this sheet is a, is a um, corresponding material from the, um, from the exhibit that my colleagues have just gone into. So here is the, the link. I'm going to put it into our chat and you can actually go to the resource folder and find that chat. Hold on one second, I have to get us to everyone. I've put it several times, but here it is. And this is also going to be the link that you will be able to go to uh, and find all of the activities, including the PowerPoint and so on. So there's a link, go to the, to the link directly and open it up. And then as you go into your groups in a minute or two, um, you can open up that document and again, go to the corresponding object uh, to the number of your group, one through 11. So we are breakout group 10. And have any of you been able to open up the document yet? So the, the first question is what makes it particularly interesting or beautiful? One thing I might bring up right away is um, just sort of the unity between the human figure and the animal figure. Mm. Like they seem sort of fused together. Mm -hmm. I think that's an interesting point. I might also add their um, together their their uprightness is a very vertical yeah uh, and there's something quite I don't know, something quite statuesque about about just how vertical the the, the piece is mm -hmm. yeah although now that you say that now when I look at it um, I notice how the human figures like leaning back so much mm. and the um, horse figure is like bending down so much. 
which sort of makes me feel, um, you know, like look at the difference in the heads. Yeah, yeah, there is a distinction there, isn't there? So that makes me revise my earlier thing and make me, you know, maybe like in terms of like torso and legs, there's some unity, but in terms of heads, they're really different to me. Mm. Like in terms of leaning back or not. Yeah. Well, the one, well, with the, the way the one lean, the way the human figure leans back, the way the animal figure leans down, right. they're almost in mirror image of one another. Yeah. So there's a real symmetry. Right. Right. I also find myself wondering whether this terracotta was ever painted, um, whether it ever had any pigmentation, right. whether it was always, uh, whether it was always monotone. Right. Um, you know, and I don't know enough about terracotta art of the, you know, of the period and region to be able to say, but I certainly know that in many other cases, um, you know, medieval art that we now look at as monotone was actually painted right. in its in its earlier in it, in its earlier life. Right, right. So, so that brings up an interesting question. Right, right, because that could make it um, the much more distinct from each other. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I can't resist unmuting myself. That was a really oh come on comment. in, and especially when you look at the contemporary connect. Um, image they're so colorful the yeah. quilted armor and the whole thing is hard to imagine even resisting making them <laughs> colored right it's true it's true you're right it would, it would almost take a, a feat of will to, <laughs> <laughs> to resist painting it <laughs> hmm. well do you want to move on to the second question maybe what technical skills were needed to produce me right My goodness. I mean, what, uh, <laughs> what, what technical skills are left out of creating right. sculpture, right? Right. <laughs> sort of like what technical skills weren't needed right. to produce this. Well, right. And I can't look closely enough, but it looks, it looks to me like you would be sort of, I mean, you must have had very fine tools, right? To get the um, like bracelets around the wrist and stuff, as well as the sort of um, expression on the face. Yeah. Yeah, you would have had to have very fine tools. I think that's absolutely correct. Especially the mouths. I think the mouths are, there's a lot of expression right. in the mouths. Right. So, yeah. And look at the man's arms. Like, look how, um, I mean, it's one thing for the horse, because the horse has kind of like blocky front legs. But look at the yeah. man's arms. Like, they're just, they feel fluid to me. And the fact, mm -hmm. like, it almost looks like it should be wood or something as opposed to terracotta. Yeah, I think that's, that's an excellent point. Well, I'm, mm -hmm. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, there is a fluidity there that's very much, uh, it's very alive. Right. Um, I wonder if the man's neck, look at his neck, it's kind of thick with respect to like the arms and stuff. And I wonder if that's just um, a decision the artist makes, um, maybe both to show the dominance of the human figure, but also so the head doesn't fall off. <laughs> you, you know, if you got too, am too ambitious with that neck and then you end up with like a headless horseman kind of thing. I'm gonna share screen. I brought up a larger um, version of it. Oh, okay. Um, just now. So are you seeing that? Yes. Oh, thank so you. So there we've got some better detail to look at in terms of the skill, the technical skill of it. I'm wondering how we should read the um, circles, like the spherical parts. Mm -hmm. Do you mean around the head um, as well as the... Uh, like the torso? 
Oh yeah. Okay. And, and then see you this kind of, kind of medallion on the side over here. And right. Then, yeah. Do you mean that? Well, I'm just um, I'm thinking more just on the um, the human figure, like it's sort of at the neck. So maybe that looks like some kind of decorate. I guess it's sort of decorative elements. Um, I'm just wondering about that one on the torso too. Yeah. Also, I think with the image that you just brought up, Susan, we don't want to inflate the uh, the the sculpture we have the biggest detail of in that image is not the largest one in the image we were originally looking at the image to the right so those are two different um, two different pieces right and uh, I like ours uh, better I think ours is cooler <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah the helmet um, is really neat like he looks like a real guy right like he does yeah no I think there's a lot more like you said, fluidity. Yeah. In you know, in the tallest image on the right. Um, yeah. And unlike the guy on the left, like he's not drowning in um, gear. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you know, you feel you feel a sort of um, body presence there, not just um, like a warrior who's being defined by his gear or his armor or something. So maybe to the technical skills more, um, you know, I was thinking of either one of the mounted horsemen. It is not easy. If I were doing this in a ceramics class, um, that nag would become really sway back really fast and probably the figure would collapse onto the floor. Yeah. <laughs> so they're, they're being able to model this um, and balance, like you see how the, how the foot is connected in this one on the left the foot is connected to for stability to the front leg of the animal right so there's a it's a real balancing feat here especially here with the longer one that um, the taller one in the group it seems to be a lot easier to make the ones that are in the, the more vertical than the mounted one is the most difficult one altogether yeah like you get to the point where it's the wrists and the hands and the and the, and the sort of bracelets right above where the head is like that just looks like it must have been incredibly fine work and then the engraved patterns on so vanessa what's our next question all right hold on let me get it our next question is what story do i have to tell about the life and times mm -hmm. of the people who made and used me I mean, um, Brenda always says that, you know, how shocked people usually are uh, at the fact that, you know, horses are used for these various, not only, you know, ceremonial, but for actual practical purposes, you know, during this time. So maybe something about the use of horse and maybe then about the ornaments that are on the horses and on the humans. Right. I wonder also, if there is a... Just, oh, go ahead. Oh, go on. Oh, no, uh, I just, you go. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I wonder if there's a certain uh, spiritual element about mm -hmm. the upturned head. Yes. Um, you know, not only does it, not only does it mirror the animal and, uh, and sort of create a, a distinction, mm -hmm. both a, both a relationship and a distinction between mm -hmm. the human and the animal. Yes. But nice. the fact that the human's head is is specifically turned upwards, yeah. even rather than straight on, right. could be saying something about the um, the spiritual comportment of of the creator and their community. That's interesting too, because you know when you're when you're in a savanna, and you're riding a horse it would be so natural to look up to the sky and, ex mm -hmm. and just feel the freedom of riding, you know, in this enormous flat landscape, you know, of Savannah. So maybe that really expresses that kind of feeling that, um, like for us, you know, riding in a car, it gives us a certain sense of freedom with the top down if it's a convertible <laughs> and, you know, and this is, this is a, but the horse is like riding under you and it's this really, really fluid experience. Of Although I might nature. the fact that the horse is, I mean, the horse is stationary, right? Like its legs aren't like bent or anything. So that might even um, 
you know, you, you might be tempted, I'm just speculating, but almost a kind of contemplative spirituality, you know what I mean? Like a moment where you like pause and then you sort of just look up and you're kind of in this spiritual moment or in a moment kind of with your environment. It feels to me too, like the, um, the figure's head is up, but not looking at us, right? So oh that would almost um, support a more maybe spiritual interpretation as opposed to somebody looking right at us, like calling us to engage sort of as equals. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. And it could also speak, uh, similarly, it could speak to to temporal, to earthly political status of, of the figure mm -hmm. as well. Right. Mm -hmm. there, there's a way in which this figure is above us, right. whether that be spiritual <laughs> yeah. or temporal. Yeah. And they yeah. would have been high status individuals that had right. horses. Hmm. Exactly. Right. So connected. And we could read some of the text there too to give, so give us an idea. Of them. Horsemen, a common theme, point to the importance of cavalry for territorial expansion and security. A breed of small horses when, was indigenous to the region, and larger Arabian horses were also imported across the Sahara. This group of figures relates stylistically to others that were excavated from mounds near Bamako, Mali's capital, where they had been intentionally buried. Hmm. Expansion and security. Right. So he's a protector over mm -hmm. the people. Mm -hmm. A warrior. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and that protection, that warrior status is also linked to Mali's economic power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that also kind of brings us to the present connect uh, example, you know, how they dress up, you know, with these, this time with clothes that, you know, and what else? Let's see, where is it? So here's mm -hmm. the colors. Right. Look at those colors. Festive, royal looking, a reverence for the animal. Mm -hmm. There's a lot going on there. Right. I wonder yeah. if the relative simplicity of our sculpture has something to do with um, its presence in, you know, being buried with, with uh, you know, in a burial mound, you know, that it's sort of, again, sort of going beyond the earthly in some way. I mean, there's definitely some things that you can see, but it doesn't, it doesn't seem like a heavily adorned body. Although I guess we see right there by the horse, you know, there's, there's things right there in addition to what's on the human figure. Yeah, and that's a real contrast with the other figure. The right, Egyptian right. The figure was, you know, definitely tricked out in armor and all the, all the equipment that, that would be in the picture, in the photograph. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But this one is definitely more otherworldly. And this other yeah. horse has such attitude compared to our <laughs> horse. <laughs> Now, one thing that I can't make out very well are the nature of the engravings on the uh, on the figure. Mm -hmm. um, from what I can tell from this vantage point, they're you know, they seem they're, they're decorative, but they're still pretty they're still pretty sparse. Mm -hmm. They're not as uh, yeah. They seem to both speak to the fact that there should be that that. Ideally, there is more decoration, or at one point there would have been, right. but that it has been stripped down. So mm -hmm. almost, you know, it's expressing a kind of royal or high yeah. political or warrior status, but also, but also suggesting there's now a remove from sort of all the glory of that. Right. So, mm -hmm. yeah. so reading this thing, it seems like the use of the one on the left is more from this worldly celebrating ancestors in some kind of shrine mm -hmm. whereas this one is is grave goods is buried so it's right. definitely the more um otherworldly spiritual right, like elegant you know what it almost reminds me of um like a minimalist it almost reminds me of ballet like the way <laughs> that you would see a ballet dancer sort mm -hmm. of pose 
and sort of just be having their having their body communicate something um you know uplifting mm -hmm. interesting so do we think that we're ready to um have some one of you folks portray this object as if you are it speaking and 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 i would think also to remember the that you the last question is is there anything similar to me in your lives today i think i mean the the correlation to the ballet i think that's a a good one to have in mind but in any case you can choose any of these four questions to kind of focus on or you can pick a few different aspects of what we just discussed and may you know you can do it in poetry form or you can just have a couple of sentences however you feel creatively inclined okay. So do you want to represent uh, us or do you want me to do it? I think you should do it. I, <laughs> oh, I acquiesce to you. <laughs> All right, but can, can Cord, if, if, if you mind, if you, you chime in if I screw up. Uh, you won't screw up, but I will chime in if I <laughs> you feel can have, anything. You can actually have added. a chorus because you have the different figures. You can oh, have yeah. sort of a chorus might be fun to do. <laughs> you know, uh, that's true. That's true. These, I will these say, guys are accompanying the horsemen into the other world. <laughs> <laughs> I will say one thing too, uh, just real quick about the comparison between these two figures. I uh, I can see the remnants of more pigment on the more worldly mm -hmm. figure. Yeah, you can tell that there was paint there. Yes. The other one, sure, maybe there was paint and it's all gone. Yeah. But we, you know, but we can't really see much of any remnant of it. Well, it was under um, the ground, so yeah. And well, this one right. was, as you can see, the reddish, you can see the, the dark black. Yeah, definitely. When we reconvene, will everybody be able to see both of these? Like, will they have this in front of them? Uh, we can screen share when okay. we do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, well, thank you. Know, you. Um, this activity was developed, uh, we've been working on this for quite a while, but it was developed, uh, the idea of the object speaking, um, because students so often go to an exhibit and they just kind of feel overwhelmed by the art and, and uh, it, you know, and don't kind of know what to say about it. And so getting inside the object. And then I found that when they come back and into the group, they just really hammed it up. So feel free to, uh, you know, to let yourself go. <laughs> <laughs> No pressure. <laughs> no, no, no. Just, it's just, it's all for fun, you know. Yeah, but thank you for sharing this exercise with us too. This sure. would be really useful. Fantastic. And you know, my my courses are you know all literature, but I often do augment the literary with the visual, and this yes. would be sure. this would be very helpful exercise. Yes, yeah. agreed. <laughs>